During the pandemic, one of the popular slogans that dotted the countryside was, we're in this together. The problem was, it wasn't true. I've never experienced such a fragmented Canadian culture as I have witnessed over the last few years. I would claim that it isn't the virus that has divided us, but the policies over which many of us have disagreed. Whatever you think of the slogan, it's well-intentioned. We have to get through this together. But I thought many times after seeing the slogan that that very well could be a biblical statement of who the church is. The church is in this together. We are one in Christ. We are the family of God on earth. We are the church. We are really in this together. No Christian should ever feel lonely because we're in this together. So let me digress a little bit and remind you that the way that you think and feel and act toward other people, especially Christians, is one of the strongest indicator of your relationship with God. God is genius, goes without saying, I know, but he is genius in designing us to live in community. You cannot be functioning as a Christian and not be in this thing of life together. We are in this together. That's why Paul told the Galatians, God gave you freedom, but don't use your freedom to make a show in the flesh, hurting others. For the whole law, he says, he says, the whole law is this, in love serve one another, but the whole law is fulfilled in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But be careful, Paul said, be careful, some of you are biting and devouring each other, be careful that you don't destroy each other. He says at the end of Galatians chapter 5, I've never seen so many sincere Christians biting and devouring one another, and filled with such anger toward other believers as I've seen in the last few years. And it is not indicative of the true nature of the church, nor the commandments of the Bible. We are in this together. I can't get through this without you. You say, through what? <laughs> All of it. Life. I can't get through faith. I can't get through burdens and blessings without you. God designed us to need each other. You need me, and I need you, and you need each other. And I can prove it to you in Galatians chapter 6. Would you grab your Bibles and let's study the first 10 verses together in a message I'm simply entitling, We're in this together. One of my favorite words is the word together. My wife and I were in love as 17 and 18-year-old kids, and uh, we, we were looking for a Bible verse that would sort of become our theme verse as a couple, and we were reading together one night in Psalm 34, and we came across verse 3, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together, and we both said that's the theme of our life. It's not just married together, but together serving the church who must learn how to glorify God together. I'm getting ahead of myself. There are no freelancers in the church. There are no lone rangers in the church. There are no lone wolves in the church. You were added to Christ at the moment of salvation, and you were added to his body, the church. You cannot take Christ and reject his church. But more than that, we are responsible for each other. I'll talk to you about that this morning. And I couldn't wait to get back and simply say to you, the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it because God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. This is the truth and word of God. I love the way he starts in chapter 6. Brothers, that is to say family of God, brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression. You who are spiritual, we'll talk about who they are, should restore him or her in a spirit of gentleness. Oh, and by the way, keep watch on yourself, 
because you too could be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I like this next word. Because some of you are so macho, you're so strong, you're so independent, you would never tell anybody that your heart is broken and you're carrying a big burden. You're so doggone independent, you think you're more than you are, and you don't really realize you need each other. Now that's a little bit of an editing, but that's what he says. Bear one another's burdens, fulfill, fulfill the law of Christ. And it, by the way, any of you who think you're something when you're nothing, you deceive yourself. Conceit deceives humility and forms. Verse 4. But, even though he's told us you should bear your own burden, each of us must test his own work, or that is himself, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each of us must bear the unique load God has given us to carry. Let the one who is a student share all good things that he has with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that will you reap. For the one who sows to the flesh is going to reap corruption, decay, sin, further chaos, brokenness, loneliness. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So let's not get weary. Don't get tired of doing the right thing, doing good. Why? Because in due season, you will reap. You will reap. You're going to get your reward if you don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. That's what he's saying. Don't ever quit. Don't quit. Keep moving forward faithfully in what God has called you to do. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Isn't that great? This church should be the most generous church to the whole city of Mississauga. But don't you dare forget your household of faith, he says, the household of faith. So what does it mean to be in this together? It means, number one, to lift up the fallen. When somebody stumbles away, err, errs in some spiritual way, we are, we're supposed to restore them. We're family, you see. And brothers and sisters watch someone they love make a bad judgment spiritually or outright transgression, we're going to intervene in the spirit of a family member. We're... So if, listen to me carefully, you know what this means? It means that if you cast a blind eye when a brother or sister stumbles in some way, you share their guilt. When you know that a Christian is walking away from his Lord and do nothing about it. The guilt falls on your shoulders too. Because he's commanding, restore those who have fallen. And he says we're like a family that takes care of each other. By the way, he says we do that for several reasons in the passage. One of which is we're aware that it could be us. <laughs> uh, I'm not judging you, my brother, because I know this evil heart of mine. And I could fall away just as those of you who've been walking with God for a long time and think you're not susceptible to walking away from God now are blinded. We are all aware that any of us, any of us, that's what he says, if any of you, that means our chairman who's walked with God for 50 plus years, who reads his Bible every morning and prays and witnesses Christ and is a support in the, he's as susceptible that's what this text is saying. If any of you, any of you. So we're not scandalized when somebody sins. We should be scandalized we do nothing about it. We don't care enough to get our hands dirty and walk with them in, in their struggle. And he says, if any of you err in any way. So he sort of broadens it, and I think he's saying it doesn't necessarily have to be a, uh, a, a great sin can just be really bad judgment about their life. You want to speak up. I once watched a young man who was about to marry a gal he shouldn't have married. We all knew it, but we were all scared to death to say anything. But I knew if I didn't, God might just put me under discipline. So I called him in, called his dad up, said, I think this is going to be a disaster. I don't think everybody has their eyes open. I think this is going to be a mistake. 
Well, I won't tell you the outcome of that story. Aware that any of us could sin in any way. But watch this now. He positions this passage to say, but the church is a safe place where restoration is supposed to be happening. The church is the place where fallen Christians, sinning saints, broken people come to have their hearts mended. We of all people should be the one that takes the hand of the fallen and lifts them up to their heavenly Father. We should be the ones who go after the fallen and try to restore them back to God because the church is a safe place. Some, Daryl was right last week. A lot of people have had bad experiences with the church. I've had a few run-ins with the body of Christ, but by and large, I have to tell you, my experience through many long years is that a church will follow its leadership, and if the leadership know how to restore the fallen, the church will get in, in line and extend grace and forgiveness and love. I've done some crazy things through the years that were not common, one of which is asked a couple who had sinned grievously to stand before the church family on a Sunday morning and tell the church what they had done and ask the church to forgive them. And I thought all hell would break loose. I thought people would be so mad at me. I once confronted a pedophile, by the way, and people were angry at me for doing that. I kicked him out of the church. I publicly condemned him. But in another situation, I asked a young couple to come and speak to the church. They did. I'll never, ever forget it. Every single person in that church formed a line that literally wrapped around the church several times to wait in line to say to that couple, forget it. We forgive you. It's done. No more talk about it. And it was dealt with. It was over. They were restored. And glory to God, they went on to serve Jesus as missionaries that I had the privilege of commissioning them. Exciting. When you restore the God's word knows best. The church should be a safe place. But you know what? The, the church feels for many people is the last place I'd tell anybody that I'm sinning or I have fallen because <clears throat> they might view me differently. We have a perception problem. We have, a, we have an image problem. We care more about what we look like than we do, than we really are. We're broken people. Church family, we're broken people. We all are broken people. The church should be the place where we can say, I didn't do well this week. <laughs> I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I'm lonely. I'm, I've sinned. Pray with me. Wouldn't it be great if people who have sinned could find a sister or brother here? They could pray together and they'd walk out and realize, I've been restored. Because, you know why? Because God is the God of restoration. God is the God of forgiveness. God is the God of second chances. That's what this passage is telling us. So he says, you need to create an atmosphere of, of gentleness, of love and respect in the congregation. I remember experiences as a young Christian when church discipline was enacted and it really felt like the entire emphasis was on the punishment, not the cure. And I learned from it and said, that's not the way I will ever do it. I was once asked to confront a young man. We were, I was on, a, I was on a, a tour with a singing group and we got a call from home that this young man had, had uh, broken the law quite seriously. Uh, and, and had sinned grievously before God, and he was one of our main soloists uh, on the tour. And uh, I watched the older guy who led the team uh, tear into the young man and back him up against the wall and wag his finger in his face and threaten him. And I stood there and watched him. He'll never admit if he's done anything. So I said later to the old guy, how about, I'm sorry, the old guy, the older guy. I'm now the old guy, by the way. I'm now the older guy. I said to the older chap, how about you just go on? I'm going to take this lad, and he and I are going to steal away during the performance tonight and find a quiet place somewhere. I found a restaurant in a corner in the restaurant, and I sat down, and I started to weep with him. I couldn't help it. I wept. I said to him, you know what? If you, I, I can sense you're guilty. When we're guilty, we, we wear it all over ourselves. And... Your life will never be the same if you don't stand up and face this thing right now. Face it now. And he started to cry. 
He said, I did it and more. But I want a clean slate. How do I get it? That's exactly what this passage is telling us we're supposed to do. Help sinners, that's all of us, who stumble in the way, that's all of us, find their way back to God. That's a great, great word. That's just verse one for heaven's sakes. Number two, let me show you. Number two, he says, you're supposed to restore, lift up the fallen in a spirit of gentleness. Number two, bear one another's burdens. Just flat out help each other get through life. Help each other put a shoulder to somebody else's burden. Uh, bear each other, uh, help somebody else lift up the load that they are carrying. Do you know how utterly simple this is? It simply means saying to somebody, I heard that you are facing such and such, and I want you to know I care, and I'm praying for you. I often say to people, is there anything more I can do? And they'll say, you have no idea. Just to know that you are standing with me and praying with me lifts my burden. I was overwhelmed this past week. I spent two hours with the Penny family getting ready for the funeral this afternoon. And Basil said to me, you know, the other night when you called me, I I hadn't slept all night. Can you imagine? Your 44-year-old son dies Tragically, a medical incident, very sad, very sad. But he said, something, Pastor, something in me changed when you called and prayed with me. Something in me changed. You know what that was. The burden was shared. But see, the problem is, many of you will never tell anybody the burdens you're carrying. How can you bear each other's burdens if you don't tell somebody the burden you're carrying? Most of the time, if I ask many of you, can I help, you'll say, I'm fine, I've got this. No, you don't got this. Pardon my grammar. No, you don't got this. No, you don't, according to the Bible. That is to think that you are something when you are nothing. Because everybody needs a helping word of prayer or hand once in a while. If you don't come down off your high horse and say to people, if you don't build a repertoire of people around you that know you well enough to say, uh, you look burdened, can I help you? Can I pray with you? We don't need you meddling in somebody else's life. That's not what I'm talking about. We don't need you snooping for the latest gossip from somebody's life. We need you to really care and just pray and say, I'm there, man. Sister, I'll help. How, How can I be a blessing to you? I want to spend the rest of my days saying to people, how can I help you bear this burden? Because the text does say, in the end, you're all going to carry it yourself. Well, why does he do that? Because he doesn't want us to become leeches and emotionally dependent upon others. And there are lots of people that do that. They don't know how to build personal responsibility and strength to face the burden they have to carry on their own. They are wholly dependent on others all of the time. And God sets boundaries. Good, this is a good boundary, isn't it? That the church is a caring place, but we have to be careful not to get trapped with those who, if we give them our cell number, will call us 10 times a week. We don't want that to happen, right? You have to put boundaries around. I just read a great book called Boundaries for Your Soul. I urge you to read it. It's very, very good. You have to know how to set boundaries around people who are hurting. You can't take the responsibility of somebody else's burden on your shoulder. It's their burden to carry. But each man, he says, must bear his own burden. What is he, he, and, and, and bearing our own burden. So Paul says this. What I need you to do is test and examine yourself and see whether or not this weight is too heavy because you're not trusting the Lord in the midst of it. How do I know that? Because the Bible says Jesus is the great burden bearer of the world. He can take any burden that you have on your shoulders right now and give you ample grace to carry it. Do you have a prodigal son or daughter that have wandered far from God and it haunts your every night It crushes your heart. You have to know how to say, Lord Jesus, I don't think anybody could care more than I do about my prodigal child. Perhaps you are plagued with same-sex attraction. 
and you're seeking to follow Jesus. You want to be true to the commandments of Scripture to get your identity from Him. But it's a great weight upon your mind and you carry a terrible shame. You come to Jesus. You've walked down the painful road of a spouse that you have loved who divorces you without cause. Your heart is ripped in two. You can hardly breathe. It consumes your mind. Who is sufficient to bear those burdens? Jesus. Cast all your care upon him. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. So how do I carry my own load? I learn to do it by faith. I can take my burdens to God and say, I have to give this to you. Have you learned to do that? I have. I've had to say to God because there's some things in my life that almost crush me. At some moment I have to say, Lord, you have to take it from me. And he always does. He always does. He takes it far from me. That's why Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is what? Well, take Jesus' burden. His burden is light. Some of you are carrying the, the, the load, the burden of addiction to drugs, to alcohol, I heard the other day about a man who fell into alcoholism and was so ashamed he couldn't come back to the church. So one day his pastor called him and met him. And he said, I'm too ashamed. I've become an alcoholic. To which his pastor says, the church is the place you need to be. Come and join the community of the fallen, the sinners, who can get, come back and get your life restored. That's what Paul is saying Lend a hand to somebody in need. Thirdly and lastly, so generously into each other's lives. That's the next sentence or paragraph in verses 6 through 10. Paul goes from saying, you need to care for each other. You need to bear each other's burdens. And now he says you need to share everything you have with those who are in need. Christians are marked by generosity because God is a generous God. So he begins with a simple illustration, and he says, if, if your teacher is giving you the knowledge he or she has learned, then if you have something they need, make sure you share with it. That was part of the ancient world, right? They didn't live in the wealth that we do, and so they, they helped each other out. Sounds like a pretty good plan. But notice how he quickly, after so the, the, the student shares with the teacher, then he quickly talks about the char character of God. And the character of God is... Don't be deceived about this. The manner in which you live your life is what you will reap in the end. If you're a stin stingy, angry, divisive, hard-nosed person, you know what you're going to get back? Stingy, angry, hard-nosed reaction. But if you are generous... You, if you sow generosity, you get generosity back. If you sow kindness, you'll get kindness back. It's very powerful. It's so simple that a child can understand it, but yet it is squarely in the middle of Scripture. You give people what they give to you, you're letting somebody else determine who you are. Ask God to give you a generous heart. Now, he gives us a warning. If you are sowing to the flesh, that part of you that lives in rebellion to God that wants you to be the God of your own life, and you get to call the shots, that part of you that is the old man in rebellion to God and resisting God, the flesh that, that Paul said, there is no good thing in my flesh, that is the old man that doesn't want what God wants. I want to do my own thing. I want to have my own fun. I want to call my own shots. I want to write my own rules. I want to write my own rules. You're going you're gonna to sow corruption, decay, and disaster. But if you sow your life to the Holy Spirit, to a spirit life, you're going to row, excuse me, you're, gonna, you're going to receive eternal life. If you sow to the Spirit, you receive eternal life. And then Paul says, so don't get weary in well-doing. 
Why are you tired of giving whatever people need? Keep on doing good. You know what he's saying here. The church and Christians should be filled with good works. It's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Believers who are filled with good works love to give and help and serve their neighbors, their friend, complete strangers, but especially the household of faith. Uh, my wife comes to the first service, so I can say it. I've had the privilege now for 38 years, 39 years. We've been together for 40 years. We, we met and started dating 40 years ago. We got married three years later. I've never met another human being that is more filled with good works than she. she. Every day of her life, she is baking something, creating something, or giving something to somebody else. I tell her, I've told her for 40 years, I don't have a paycheck. You spend it all. <laughs> you just give it to everybody else. And, and we're, 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 we're looking forward not too many years to retiring. I won't be your pastor forever, right? I'm getting close to 60. And you know what we're going to do in our retirement? We'd like to go somewhere overseas to serve needy and hurting people. I want to, I want to spend my life being filled with good works. I want to be able to find somebody who's hurting and help them. I want to find somebody who's in need and see if I can't help to meet that need. I want to listen to people's broken hearts and say to them, but I know the healer of broken hearts. He can mend your hurting life. He loves to do that. So keep doing good. So the bottom line is that you have to see the people who are the church. Are you seeing them? Did you stop on the way in and look at the people you were coming down the walkway with? Did you look at each other in the eye? Did you see the people? Do you see the people who are in church with you this morning? Do you even know that you're in a big crowd of people? You've got to see them, but you've got to know them. You can't just see them. You've got to get, that's why you need to get in a small group or a Bible study. You're, there are no ghost members of this church. You can't just come to Sunday morning and disappear. You've got to take deliberate action to join a small group or get into a Bible study or build relationships with in the men's group, the women's group, just different ways. You've got to build relationship. You've got to see people. You've got to know people. And you've got to love people. And when you do, great miracles will happen. We're in this together. Church family, would you do me a favor? I know this is going to be awkward for you, but would you all stand to your feet? And I, want you, I don't want you to move out of your chair. I'm going to stay right where you are. We're going to prepare for communion. But just do me a favor. Listen to my instructions before I say go. I'll tell you go when it's time. I want you to slowly turn around. Now, some people cheated in the first service. They turned and looked at their husband or wife. <laughs> Not allowed. I want you to take a moment, as awkward as it feels, and turn around and find somebody else to look right in the eye. Wave at them. Go. Turn around. See the people who are serving you. <laughs> 